Thanks for having me. The, it, it's been a really remarkable time, especially as we, we t start realizing the power of data. And, and there's nothing better than, than having Rick really introduce this. And one of the things that I think is really there is to really start to ask ourselves about what's holding ourselves back. And as we start to really think about this, you know, there's a lot of truth, there's a lot of hype. And we got to ask ourselves, what's the truth, what's the hype, where's the separation? And one of the ways to start thinking about that is just to take a look back in the last year or so and see what type of impact data has had on our daily lives and all of the things. And a lot of that's just captured in uh, Rick's talk. And to give a sense of that, you know, one of the way, things that really emphasized how fast this word big data or data in itself has just taken over is just by the way people started out talking about it, even putting it up there as a potential word of the year. And it's not just that. And it's, uh, like it's on all the major news covers. It's about there. And you know it's a big deal now suddenly when Harvard tells you it's a big deal, right? That's, that's our true measure of, of what's important. But it goes on, you know, Moneyball. When's the last time you heard somebody pitch you on something and said, oh, it's the money ball of this. It's the new idea. Everyone's talking about how data is starting to give you a competitive advantage, how you can use data to really get that edge. One of the powerful examples we saw of direct action is in weather forecasting, something we've worked on for years. This is an example of what we call an ensemble of forecasts, many different forecasts showing the path of Hurricane Sandy. Several years ago, it was actually quite controversial just to even show the trajectory of a hurricane more than once, more than one model's worth. Why? Because people didn't believe the public could actually understand what it meant if you showed all these trajectories. And so here you see all these different outcomes, and it's pretty obvious that you say, oh, there's a lot of predictability near the center of the hurricane, and it gets less certain elsewhere. But what we do understand from that is the actions we should take, moving people out of the way, taking proactive actions to save lives. And that is something now that has become very much a, a natural mode in which people act and understand and interpret this data. We've also seen a lots of big impacts in national security, how people are using data to identify threats against uh, uh, sovereign interests, people are using it to understand people are attacking things. We've seen people start to use even data for offensive measures. Uh, one of the cases of taking out uh, uh, the centrifuges in Iran, these type of activities. And even recently in our election, we had a big election in the US. One of the big things that became very pronounced in the election was how people are using data. When you think of politics and you think about elections, the last kind of person you think about is actually running an election is this kind of guy. Because he looks like the prototypical person you have in an election, right? This is Harper Reed. He's the CTO for the Obama campaign. And what he's known for is how they actually use data. How do they actually use data to treat things in a new way, to get out the message, get out votes, to interact with people in new ways. So much so, to give it such a competitive, end, competitive edge, what do they call it? Of course, Moneyball, right? It's Obama's Moneyball campaign and that power. And it wasn't just restricted to the campaign. You had people like Nate Silver who were going out and making forecasts, predictions about how the election were gonna go. And you had all these people saying he's wrong. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And look what happened. All of a sudden, he's incredibly precise. So much so, he didn't just predict the outcome of the US, uh, the presidential elections, but also the individual Senate races. And so with that, we're seeing all these kind of areas in all this place, with some of the stuff that Rick talked about. And it's almost like we face this new model where finally, the data scientists are taking back. We're finally back in charge. And it's such a way that now it's not just in this reality of this world of where we're thinking about it for business purposes, we're instrumenting ourselves. We're now marking ourselves with data. We're treating ourselves as data products. How so? Let's see, there we go. We are instrumenting ourselves, we got our fuels, we got our ups, we got our sleep monitors, we got our blood pressure monitors, all this stuff where we are now the data product in itself. And we're trying to understand this, how we use the data to better take actions for either things like chronic diseases or just better improvement by saying, let's walk more. And it goes on inside our homes. This is a Nest thermostat. 
where what it does is it's listening to all this data coming into your house, and what's it trying to do? It's trying to make sure your house is warm when you get there. But it doesn't need to be warm the entire time. It's trying to save energy by reducing the te temperature when you're not there. It's trying to add efficiencies, make the world smarter. Same way with the Google car. Takes in all this data, frees you up, makes your life easier. We can even put things in incredibly hostile environments. This is curiosity and taking all the data to tell us something about a place that is uh, not easy to get to. This is, when you think about airplanes, many of us traveled here. We've got about 20,000 operating right now. We're going to have 30,000 more engines in 15 years. And what's amazing about this is we've got these new engines. This is a new one that's from GE. And the most important part about this is it's measuring 290 parameters 16 times a second. This is a kind of engine that, you, that tells you when it's getting sick. It starts to inform you in advance that you, it's not feeling well, it's not doing well, so to take proactive measures. What it also does is it reports back about flight patterns and all the other things that help you get additional efficiencies. You add 1% in fuel savings, you get about $30 billion over the next 15 years, just as a simple measure. And so with that, what's holding us back? All this talk, all this great stuff, there's still a big gap about data. Why aren't we using data more often? What's holding us back? And the way I think of the best way to sum it up is to think about this statement. Let's, no, no matter, there we go. Best statement from Dan Arley. He's a professor at Duke. And so what he says is big data is like teenage sex. Everyone talks about it. Nobody really knows how to do it. Everybody thinks that everyone else is doing it, so everyone claims that they're doing it. Some of the people are laughing because they're like, yeah, I, I t we have a big data strategy. Sure, sure, it's, we got slides. Uh, and so what's holding us back? I want to walk you through a few things I think are critically holding us back. And the first one is our need for data-driven decisions. And what's there is we have our classic executive. They make decisions. When they do make decisions, they like to think they may use data. So I want to introduce you to the person who I think of is the best data, is the best decision maker in the world. Kirk. Why is Kirk the best guy in the world? Because he has an amazing data scientist that's always with him. And that data scientist is always on the bridge. Why is that important? So here's an average day in the life of Kirk. Oh, here's the Romulans. Oh, great, now it's gotten really bad. There's the Klingons too. What does he do? Does he send some ensign to the turbo shaft, down the turbo shaft, down into the bowels of the ship, and they sit there and says, hey, the captain wants some data? Some guy sitting in a dark room says, that's not the data the captain wants. He says, just give me the damn data. Goes back up, shows the captain the data, and says, that's not the data I want. Guy goes back down and he says, that's not the data of the one. He says, duh, I told you so. Meanwhile, the ship's blown up. That is what happens in every kind of meeting room. Instead, what really happened? What does, what does Kirk do? Turns around and says, Spock, what do you think? What's the first word Spock says? Curious. And then starts to talk about the data, understanding, interpreting it. Why is that so important? Because Spock has context. He now has context to use data to make it applicable. And so what we need is a new breed, a new breed for a new time, and these are these data scientists. They are the intersection of all sorts of different worlds. They are the people that have multidisciplinary aspects and make data come alive. And what's so is they are incredibly in demand. This is a classic quote from Hal Varian talking about how much in demand they're going to be. And the data from LinkedIn proves it. It's off the charts, and it's growing fast. Second, we are really hostages of our tools and our infrastructure. It's really painful to think about how we actually interact with data today and how we look at data. And just to give you an example of that, you know, what's holding us back from these actions is this classic Dilbert cartoon. Do we have any actionable analytics from our big data in the cloud? Yes, the data shows that my productivity plunges whenever you use new jargon. Maybe in-memory computing will accelerate your applications. Right? There's a lot of talk around this stuff. There's a lot of stuff, but what's holding that back is really simple things like the dashboard. The very basic element of the dashboard, the thing we look at every day to manage our lives or our business. Right? That's the first thing we open up. And think about that for a second. This is your average dashboard. It's got a pie chart. 
those are great colors. You know, it's like you pick some random colors out of the Crayola box. Oh, wait, you know what? Let's put some lines over there on the right. You know, because they're, you know, they're kind of dot pixel. They look like they're from an inkjet printer so it's, that's got low resolution. Oh, you know what? Let's make it 3D because that'll make it awesome. Oh, wait, we could make it even sexy by putting it on black. That's, that's going to make it really impactful. Or you know what? Let's put our, what we're working on in the background so everyone stays motivated. The simple dashboard, if you think about it, is not actionable. You don't look at the dashboard and actually know what you're supposed to do next. Are you supposed to pick up the phone and call somebody? Are you supposed to change a different lever or knob in your business? And one of the ways to simply think about that is people really love to just put more data on a page. This is what I refer to as data vomit. More data on the page does not make it actionable. What makes it actionable is people who learn how to interpret it. And one of the things that I think that is really important about that is to think about data, your dashboard, simple things like your dashboard. Think of it as a product. There's a rule we came up with in in, when I was working at the US Department of Defense, working on uh, this technology that we called the zero overhead principle. And the idea was that no technology can add any overhead. The technology must teach you to learn. And that's sort of an obvious thing these days. Why? Because did you pick up a manual ever to use Google? Facebook, LinkedIn? My four-year-old kid can kick my ass at Angry Birds and does not read. So why do we have these things like the dashboard and all these things that don't intuitively teach us more about the data that's happening around us? They have to be natural. They have to help educate us better. And that's part of the challenge of the tooling layer. There's also an incredible fallacy around artificial intelligence and machine learning. And what I want to say by that is when we talk about physicians or medicine, one of the things people say is, let me introduce you to your new doctor, right? The computer. We're saying computers should replace physicians, should we have new ways of thinking about the stuff. Well, what I think is really important is that we use the word augmentation rather than replacement. And let's go back to that Star Trek example. Because when McCoy gets somebody in the medicine room, what does he do? Does he just put him in front of a scanner? No, when he waves this little thing, goes, woo, 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 just waves over him, right? And what does he do? He interprets the data. He tells you what's happening. The computer doesn't say it. Same thing with the tricorder. People are out there, you look at the data from it, and then you interpret it. We have a human in the loop. And that's an important thing, is that we have to focus on making people more efficient with data. Take, for example, the, the classic cockpit. So you've got all these dials, all this stuff. You ever seen the inside of a fighter jet? You get heads up displays. Why? Because you've got so much information. You can't just be looking at this stuff all over the place. The systems have to augment you. Want further example? You want to fly this? What do you need? You've got to have a heads up display. Right? We have to have the information, right information at the right time to help us make better decision. It's that efficiency. The point is to keep the human in the loop, not take them out. And as we think about that, and one of the challenges around data, of course, nothing could ever go wrong when we use data. No, never. I'll give you a classic example of this. I think let's take a look at this video. That's the video, right? It's just a spinning wheel. <laughs> like TiVo thinks I'm gay. What's TiVo? It's a device that records television shows that you pick. And then based on what you pick, it records other shows that it thinks you like. You record Star Trek, TiVo assumes you like that kind of thing. And then when you're not home, it records the X-Files. So what's the problem? I had it record Will and Grace, a couple episodes of Ellen. Right away, the damn thing thinks I'm gay. Keeps recording queer as folk every episode. Last night, it recorded a Judy Garland movie. <laughs> call the company. Just tell them you're not gay. I want to be there when you make that call. Exactly. I actually tried to outfox it, get it to go the other way. I had it record MTV Spring Break, Playboy After Dark, swimsuit competitions. Thing won't budge. Insists I'm gay. It's a problem. There's the challenge. We build data products. We want to love and live the promise of data. But we also have to recognize that data can fail us. 
It can constrain us. It can bottleneck us. One of the classic lines that you always hear is about that attributed to Twain, lies, damn lies, and statistics. And how do we marry that with this world of data? How do we combine this element of saying the power of data and yet data could completely lead us astray? It can cause terrible things. One of those terrible things that we hear about often, the collapse of the financial industry. All the data that went into there. Many things, trading algorithms went off the cliff, caused great problems. So how do we marry that up? Well, one of the most important things I think we can start to think about is to use data in a conversation. Most of the time you walk into a meeting and you think, hey, the point of this meeting is to have a decision with data. No, the point of data is so you can have a conversation about it, so that you can ask, do you have the right data? Do we have the right people in the room? Can we make, or what, do we need new data or something else because we don't actually know all the things that we need to? When you find you have conversations about data, one of the most important things that comes out of it is data cannot be used as a political weapon because you are using data to create common language, common learnings, and elevate everyone in an organization. So much so that at LinkedIn, we used to have something called SSR before every meeting that, where it was involving data. What does SSR stand for? We'd look at data, we'd call it silent sustained reading, or as I prefer to call it, sit down, shut up, and read. And what we did is everyone looked at the data and anyone could ask questions about data. So everyone was becoming smarter so that we could make better decisions collectively. The other part I think which is important is we have to recognize that we don't use data to drive ourselves off a cliff. It's very easy to look at this very narrow little page with all these numbers, whole bunch of dashboard information, and we can drive us off a cliff. We need to have this conversation to do it. Now, if you don't believe me that people would actually use a lot of data and still drive off a cliff, do a simple search. Type into Google GPS and cliff and see how many people actually do. And you think about that for a second. You're driving along, you've got this giant windshield, you've got this small little tiny thing that's a GPS monitor and it's telling you turn right. And so you're ignoring everything in reality to listen to this tiny thing that's telling you to turn right off the cliff. People do it all the time. And so the trick is that you have to always look up and ask yourself, is the intuition correct? And the best way I can argue to do that is with all this talk of data, make sure you're keeping the human in the loop. The human adds creativity. The human adds subjectivity. And it always adds balance. That's why we have conversation around data. That's why we build data. Best data products always have a human in the loop to make sure that things aren't going to fail. And so with that, I'll leave you with that message of always keep in balance with data by keeping it human. Thank you.